Hello YouTube! I was thinking about something the other day. Now that my most viewed video on the platform is my response to Presh Tallwalker, and I've done three videos on that topic, on why I think that he mistakenly did not take into account the rules about the distributive law in mathematics, I think I should probably take a moment to answer a simple question. Why do I bother with those videos? My channel is quite small, it's very unlikely that Presh will ever see any of my videos. And not only that, but I get comments on that video and I respond to all of them. No matter how futile it seems to respond to such in-depth critiques as, you're wrong. So why is that? Why do I take the time to respond when Presh will likely never see it and it's not likely to affect the minds of anybody who's commenting? It goes to the heart of one of the problems that I had in school when it came to mathematics. So let me tell you a bit of a background story. When I was in second grade, I remember my teacher once giving me a packet. It had a hundred addition problems. It was all extra credit. And uh, I remember sitting at the kitchen table at my grandparents' house where we were staying at the time. And it was dark. We only had a fluorescent light for the kitchen um, overhead. Uh, pitch black outside and I was doing the math problems. I was having so much fun doing those simple addition problems. I filled out every single one of those problems for the extra credit. Why? Because it was fun! No other reason. Math was exciting for me. I loved it! Fast forward a few years though. My family moved to a new town. I was just about to start the seventh grade and the new school was tiny. In my previous school, I'd been gearing up to take pre-algebra in seventh grade, but in this new school, I was put into remedial math. Why? Because everyone was put into remedial math in seventh grade in that school. And as it turns out, they did the same thing in eighth grade too. The same exact class twice in a row. It was basic, boring, dull mathematics that I'd done in the fifth grade, having to do for two years in junior high. So to tell you how boring it was for me, in eighth grade, I just stopped doing all of my homework. And my teacher got upset with me. He came up to me one day after class and said, you've got a D in this class, but I know you know this material. All you have to do is turn in the homework. What I will do is give you 90% credit for your late homework if you just turn it in. So I spent the weekend doing that homework and turned it in. And by Tuesday, I'd raised my grade from a D to a solid B in the class simply by turning in the homework and getting 90% credit. The reality is repeating the same basic math for seventh and eighth grade was devastating to my love for math. I hated math after that. The joy I had felt when I was in second grade doing that mathematic packet, it was gone. It was just miserable at that point. Then ninth grade happened. In ninth grade, this school, same school, dropped us straight into Algebra 1. No pre-algebra, just straight into Algebra 1. And there was a philosophy. You either sank or you swam. It was up to you. You figure it out. Okay, this is not the way math should be taught, mind you. So Algebra 1 was very grueling for me, I, I, but it at least engaged my mind. It was fun again. It was hard, it was complex, but it made me think. I struggled with it for a long time, and in fact, as a freshman, I only got a C in Algebra 1. The next year I took Algebra 2 and managed to get to a B as things started to click for me. It finally started to make sense in my mind what was going on. And then in, when I was a junior, we took geometry and oh, did I fall in love with math again. Geometry is just logical proofs and it was so much fun to be able to build and create with mathematical rules. I loved that class. And I remember at one point my geometry teacher reading over one of my proofs where I'd gone out of my way to prove every single little thing that I could in my proof. And he said, well, it's kind of like if you're driving from Denver to Colorado Springs. For those who don't know, there are two towns in Colorado, roughly about 50 to 80 miles apart from each other. And he said, it's like driving from Denver to Colorado Springs via Fairbanks, Alaska. But the route was correct and it would get you there. So I took that as a compliment. Anyway, needless to say, I got an A in geometry. And then I finished my senior year in trigonometry. And I also got an A in that class. The harder the math got, the better my grade got. Not everyone in that school was as fortunate as I was. My sister, for example, she wasn't able to survive the sink or swim phase of Algebra 1. See, I personally think my sister is a much better student than I am. And yet, school killed math for her. 
It was so bad that when she went to college, she had to take the remedial math just to get her degree in liberal arts. And that was tough for her. Not because she's dumb. She knows a lot of stuff. Like I said, she's a better student than me. And in her field of expertise, she is way smarter than I am. And it's through no fault of her own. As I said, she's a victim of the school where everybody who went to that school really is a victim of that education system. The only reason I succeeded was because I inherently love mathematics. So I ground through the trauma of that horrific school system and came out on top by the end. And looking back on it, I realized the school wasn't trying to be incompetent. It was just a tiny school in the middle of nowhere. The reason seventh and eighth graders were stuck in the remedial math was because there was no qualified teacher there to teach calculus. In fact, the trigonometry teacher was really the basketball and football coach. That was his job. He was hired to coach sports teams, but he had an aptitude for math. He was good enough in math that they pressed him into service as the mathematics teacher. The problem is he never took calculus in his life. He'd taken trigonometry so he could teach up to trigonometry, but that was it. And sadly, while he had innate talent and he was a very smart person, his lack of ability shown when we were in the trigonometry classes, I believe we had six or seven students in that class by that point, And we were correcting his work while he was explaining things on the chalkboard to us. That was how bad it was. Again, not a knock on him. He did his best. It was the fact that he was the only person who could do it. So during this time, I began to discover a lot of things about mathematics that should have been taught to me, but never were. I took sort of a scientific method approach to math. For example, I remember once thinking about how a square number was really close to the value you'd get if you multiplied a number one greater than by one less than that square. Uh, I know that's somewhat complex, but basically what I mean is uh, I, I looked at six times six and that was 36, but seven times five was 35. That was one less than six times six. And then seven times seven was 49, but six times eight was 48. Again, one less. So I made an observation. I came up with a hypothesis. A square number is one greater than the number multiplied one less by one greater than that square. Okay, so that was how I reasoned. And then I went about my way testing various numbers and seeing that they all came out that way. That of course is not a mathematical proof. That is scientific proof, but it's not a mathematical proof. The good news is I was able later to prove in mathematics that what I was essentially doing is just n minus one times n plus one equals n squared minus one. And that's the formula there. And that sort of thinking, that scientific method approach to math has served me well. I've actually done a video on how I do math, how I do multiplication in my head for two digit numbers. And part of that was realizing that numbers can be represented in so many different ways. The number four isn't just four, it's two times two. It's also three plus one. And there are many ways that you can alter numbers to tweak them and make mathematics easier. But the key is in order to do that, you have to know why you're doing what you're doing normally so that you know what you can do to make it more powerful. And this is the key. This brings me back to why I insist on focusing on the law of distribution in mathematics, despite the fact that doing three videos now is basically like talking to a brick wall for those who don't want to hear. See, my own teachers were horrible. They didn't explain anything. They just said, do it do this method. We're giving you the method. You do it. You'll get the right answer. And I was saying, why? Why does it give me the right answer? What is going on with these problems that make it work? How is this working? What's the logic involved in it? And the response is shut up and do what we told you to do. And if you come up with a different way on your own, we don't understand it. So we're going to mark you down for cheating. Does it matter that I could do things in my head? I had to write down stupid work that I wasn't even doing in order to spoof as if I was doing it that way so that they could understand why I was doing the right answer. Okay, that's very frustrating. See, I do ask why. Because if you know why something works, you can optimize it. You can troubleshoot it. You can come up with better ideas. You can make it your own. Suppose you have troubles multiplying by seven. Suppose you have a phobia of the number seven. Knowing the law of distribution, you'll know that five times seven is the same thing as multiplying five times five plus two. And that's five times five is 25 plus five times two is 10 gives you 35. You just solved five times seven without using a seven at all. 
suppose you wanted to find what seven times seven is, but you have that phobia of sevens. In that case, you can do five plus two times five plus two and multiply those together, or even better, six plus one times six plus one. You can come up with all kinds of sort of things on that. Now that's all well and good, but if you don't know what the law of distribution is, you don't even know that that's possible to do. You're stuck having to grind out a way to memorize your sevens table. And yeah, I know that example is a bit extreme. Who's going to be afraid of the number seven? I mean, pff, who cares? But knowing what you can do opens up so much to you. None of that is possible if you just have to say, and the teacher says I have to do it this way. I can't think for myself that six plus one times six plus one is going to be 36 plus 12 plus one. It's that quick. And I don't have to memorize seven at that point. See, there's a lot of stuff you don't have to do if you just know how to distribute. It's amazing. So the bottom line, I don't care what a teacher says about method. I care about what is the correct answer. In fact, I remember reading the book Genius by James Gleick. He's the same guy who wrote the book uh, on chaos theory that Michael Crichton used for Jurassic Park, the, the scientific basis for that book. And Genius is about Richard Feynman, the famous physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project and who won the Nobel Prize for coming up with Feynman diagrams. And I remember in that book him explaining how he was so frustrated with the school system back then because he would come up with answers to problems in his head. He would know the answer, but the teachers would mark him down because he wasn't doing the right method. And he made the same point I am making now. Why are you punishing people for creativity, for knowing how to do things that other people don't don't know how to do? Why are you punishing them instead of figuring out how they did it? See, we have lots of people out here in the world who are idiot savants. That's the old term that was used for it. I don't know what the PC term is now, but they can do math super fast in their head. And the thing is, is there are some people who lack this communication skills who can still come up with mathematical answers faster than calculators can. And it's so fast, in fact, that when you really boil it down, it's, it's almost impossible that they're actually doing any calculating. There's some kind of trick their brain does with math that gives them the right answer. They don't know how they're doing it, it just does it for them. And see, because we're not even interested in that, we're like, we have to do this rote problem the way that it was meant to be done by the church of school. Then we don't even investigate. We don't figure out why these people can do what they do, despite the fact that by all intents and purposes, they shouldn't have that ability. They clearly do because they exist. And yet we can't explain it. Anyway, that's a bit of an aside. The reality is, as I'm saying, I don't care what any teacher says. I want to know what's actually happening when I'm doing a math problem. If you learn a process, you haven't learned a skill. You've only learned how to do what somebody else tells you to do. But if you learn the skill, if you know what's going on, you can come up with your own way that's a million times faster. That's a million times more accurate. You have that ability, but only if you know what you're doing. And maybe you'll find a shortcut that will help make things easier for everyone in the future. You certainly won't discover that path if you go along the I can only do what the teacher demands I do path. No, I want to know why. Why does math work the way it works? Why? That's the most important question to ever ask when somebody's telling you anything. Just ask why. And until you know the why, you don't know the subject. That's just the bottom line. So there you go, another math rant. At least this one is not directly responsive to Presh Talbarker again. This is just on the education system in general and my theories on it. Um, I hope that it makes some sense to you. You can agree or disagree. I'd like to hear back from you in the comments if you do either of those, either agree or disagree. In fact, I'd, I'd rather hear from you if you do disagree because disagreement builds knowledge. If everybody agrees with me, I'm not gonna learn anything new. But if you disagree, maybe you have something interesting for me to hear. As always, I hope you guys all have a wonderful day and peace out.